Hey everybody, it's Robot here from Vespa Motorsport and ScooterWest.com. So today, as of May 2022, we finally have the Royal Alley GP300S. So this is the one that everybody's been waiting for. It's pretty much the same identical body as the GP150 that we've had with us for about two years. You can see my prior video reviewing the GP150. I refer to it as a scooter that originally started with the letter L. Everybody knows what, what this is a duplicate of. I don't need to talk about that any further. So pretty much the styling's mostly unchanged from that original GP150, but now it has the full-size 300cc liquid-cooled Piaggio Vespa motor shoehorned into the frame of the scooter. It's all liquid-cooled, so it's capable of doing freeway speeds. I'll get into this top speed, and, and later in the video, I'm gonna compare this with my first-hand experience riding both a GTS 300 and this new GP300S. And I'll go over the pluses and minuses all through this whole video. It's gonna be a long one. Uh, start with the fun stuff, how it looks. It's a classic scooter. Starts with a L, a Lambretta look. Kind of replicates a, yeah, kind of close to an SX200. Some of the, the last uh, Lambrettas that were the GP200 and such, Series 3 stuff. Um, it's got the fixed fender just many of the classic styling cues of the Lambretta scooter. And that's what everybody loves about the scooter. Uh, physically, it's similar size to the Vespa GTS 300. It's got 12 inch wheels front and rear. Uh, keep in mind, they're a little bit smaller tires. It's got a 110, 70, 12 in the front, 120, 70, 12 in the rear. So they're a size down from the Vespa GTS 300. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of improvements I'll go over throughout this video on this higher end model over the 150. The 150 sometimes came with, I would say, subpar equipment out of the box. And I could say one thing about Royal Alloy, they have made several improvements over the years, especially compared to those first, first year models. Um, I'll just get right to the point. Those first years had a lot of teething problems. Lots of little issues, sometimes they strand customers. They had uh, issues with the wheel bearings, wheel speed sensors, spark plug caps popping off, hoses, and so on. Uh, I won't elaborate on the past, but I do give them a lot of credit for making a lot of improvements over the years. And one of the biggest improvements they made to this new Royal Alloy 300 is it's no longer made in China. I know most of the parts are still from the Chinese factories where they've had them molded and pressed and so on. But the scooter's assembled in Thailand. And I don't know, I'm a little bit nationalistic and like Western countries, so I'm a little bit more for countries that aren't so socialist in manufacturing goods that we buy here in North America. That's just my own opinion, but you know, something to be said about it. Thailand makes a lot of different scooters. Some of the largest Honda scooter factories are in, are in Thailand. And even Piaggio has a lot of uh, connection with that whole region, Vietnam, Thailand, and such. They got manufacturing of engines, uh, this does have an engine, it's not the one that's made in Pontedera, Italy. This is one that's made in um, Eastern Asia. Uh, still made to the exact same specs as a 2019 or earlier model a GTS 300. So it's an older generation motor, but there is a couple improvements and I'll go over that, including one for your do-it-yourselfers. And I'll, I'll say that for a little bit later in the, the video. So a quick overview of the specs. So the 300cc motor, on this, it's a little bit down on the top speed compared to a Vespa GTS 300. The gearing, I'm pretty certain, is the same in the final drive hub and same with the transmission as a 2019 GTS, but there's two things that make it a little bit slower. Well, the tire circumference is about three, three and a half per percent smaller, so that kind of limits your top speed. It definitely makes them feel quicker off the line than the older GTS 300. Not quite as quick as a 2020 and later GTS 300 with that HPE motor. It has several improvements to the whole entire power plant. Um, and also, I think they just hold it back. They do state that they have a top speed of 80 miles an hour. Uh, I couldn't find that 80 miles an hour when I took it on a t test ride. 
Ironically, the speedometer is pretty optimistic as well. So pretty much when I was traveling, indicated 75 miles an hour, I was doing about 67, 68 miles an hour. And it feels real comfortable at that speed. So I think you could cruise the highway comfortably at 65, maybe 70 miles an hour, but bringing it all the way up to that top speed of my guess is around 70, 75, 77 miles per hour. Uh, the motor's kind of at the end of its lungs um, move in the scooter that weighs almost 300 pounds down the highway. And the fuel tank capacity. So it's similar to a Vespa. It's usable capacity is around two and a half gallons, uh, give or take. They, they state the capacity is a little higher. Uh, well, this motor, if you're running it hard, gets around into 60s. Per miles per gallon so you can expect a range of around 150 miles so that's decent enough for touring it could be better but it's definitely not like some scooters where they can only go 100 miles of range on a tank full some of the pitfalls of the scooter you open up the seat unlike almost all other modern scooters there's no storage whatsoever underneath the seat uh, you're just limited to this pretty small glove box that's locking um, it's got a little cup that you could probably put your wallet in a sm smaller size cell phone and maybe shove a small rain jacket and some gloves in there and that's about all the storage that comes factory with the scooter. Um, if you're gonna tour with the scooter, you have this lovely, very, very strong metal hook. Heck, the Vespas never came with a metal hook, and, you know, at least the modern ones. So I, you know, I could see you hanging your rucksack from this, maybe with 20 pounds of gear, and have it right in the center tunnel. And that's a very good usable storage. And of course, it comes factory with a small flat rack. Uh, of course, you can bungee some stuff to this or upgrade to the folding rack. And my next video, I'll cover all the accessories that fit this scooter. And there's several more I have in, in uh, mind too for down the road for the motor since it is that tried and true Vespa 300, especially the 2019 model and prior 300 motor that has plenty of performance accessories available for it. So you're wondering the price on this? It does come in a solid $1,400 less in a base model Vespa GTS 300. But then again, $1,400 uh, you're, you don't have the underseat storage. Uh, you're losing a little bit of the superior handling of the Vespa GTS 300, in my opinion. And same with the quality of the GTS 300. Just overall, it's a little bit better tried and true package for this motor. Serviceability is definitely a pitfall of this scooter. It's quite a bit of effort to even do basic services on the scooter, removing the cowls and such. So for about $1,400 more, you're gonna get the newer motor on the GTS, but you spend uh, pretty much $1,400 less in a GTS. It's actually more like $1,300, $1,200 because the destination fee is a little higher um, on this Royal Alloy GP300S. Um, so, you know, you got your, your pluses and minuses. You know, the Vespa, is always gonna have a great resale value. It's been proven. They've been making that model for a very long time. Uh, this is a fairly new model from a smaller manufacturer, so you have a, you know, some pitfalls there. But styling-wise, I would almost put them on par with each other. They're very different styles of scooters. Physically, and the weight is very similar. How they ride, um, I think this rides really smooth and quiet maybe a little bit smoother than a GTS, just going down a smooth road. I think the suspension's a little bit better on the GTS 300. The braking's definitely a little stronger on the modern GTSs. This does have anti-lock brakes, both front and rear. It does not have the traction control system you find on the Vespa. Um, instrumentations, they're actually more deluxe even though they're smaller on this. It's got a tachometer, a real coolant temperature gauge, and several of the same idiot lights that you find on a GTS. But having a real coolant gauge, sometimes that's a nice indication of your temperature of the motor versus just having a light that comes on when it's probably too late if the motor overheats that you'd find on a modern Vespa. So th this model right here happens to be serial number one.
So the first one imported to the United States out of the factory. It was manufactured in December of 2021. So it shows you how long it took to get to our dealership. So it was manufactured in December and we're almost on to June 2022. So kind of the modern day issues with shipping and production, they're still affecting these scooters. It's taken forever to get them over to our shores here in the United States. Um, and just limitations on productions and parts kind of limits how many are available. So our first shipment, we only got three of them. Two were immediately spoken for, uh, including serial number one is going to a San Diego owner that currently has an RA uh, GP150. So he's very excited to get the 300 and I'm happy he's getting number one. Uh, it also comes in a solid black color. I don't have it here. So only two colors for the United States. You get this ivory color, which is, in my opinion, a superior color. It's just not a solid white. It's got a real nice ivory tint. And I can tell you the paint job is definitely a step above the previous generation uh, Royal Alloys. So I don't know, they must be painting them out of a new factory, probably in Thailand. It's just there's very little orange peel. They obviously buff them to a, a higher level finish. Um, kind of impressive that they've taken the level of the paint jobs up a notch on these scooters. Pretty much close to on par with a modern Vespa where they're, um, those are robotically painted, but there's a lot of hand buffing to give them a nice uh, orange peel free finish you know, out of the factory. Let's go on to the ergonomics of the scooter. And in many ways, I feel it's a pitfall. I'm about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, so if you're any shorter or your inseam is a less than mine, I think it's gonna be a difficult scooter to ride. Uh, don't get me wrong, the GTS 300 is also a fairly tall scooter as well. But the ergonomics on this could use improvement. It comes with both a center stand and a side stand that has a safety uh, interlock switch, so definitely a little easier to use the side stand. Um, when I ride this, I feel my knees are kind of like right up into the handlebars a little bit more than when on a Vespa, so it's got a much higher floorboard height than a comparable Vespa. Um, I can easily flat foot it on both sides, so no problems for me, so you know, if you're probably, I would say 5'5 five, five or shorter, you may have a little bit of difficulty, um, you know, supporting the scooter flat footed with both feet. Um, the handlebar position, I feel it's pretty nice. Uh, it doesn't have any of that, un, you know, being a little bit longer wheelbase scooter, doesn't have any of the oscillation that a lot of people complain about, the handlebar oscillation, tank slappers, sometimes referred to, that you find on the GTS. Of course, the GTS has made quite a few improvements to the suspension. Over the years, they have a much more rigid fork now. They don't tend to do that as bad as those early generation Vespa GTSs. So these are very stable. If you're on a smooth road, they want to go straight. Um, they take sweeping turns pretty good, but the quick turns, I feel it's a little lacking. Of course, I always prefer the smaller size scooters if you want to um, have something that has quick handling. You know, something like a Vespa Sprint or Primavera or even a genuine buddy. It's just gonna be a quicker handling scooter, shorter wheelbase. Um, even smaller tires sometimes will make them handle a little quicker. Uh, for passenger comfort, I've never ridden as a passenger or have had anybody uh, ride on the back of one of these. I've just taken one out at the shop. So I don't have a ton of firsthand experience, but you can move to the split seat. There is an optional bench seat. Um, I can tell you one thing, for passenger comfort, it's probably going to be much better than the Vespa GTS. You can see the passenger foot peg is kind of in a more neutral uh, position, unlike the Vespa one where you kind of have to reach around towards the front as a passenger to catch the passenger pegs. And these kind of just snap right back in place. Maybe you find them useful on a long ride as well you know, where you have somewhere else to put your feet other than the floorboard. So as for the controls, electrical and lighting, it's almost all LEDs. They got these uh, pod turn signals that you find on several of the American market vehicles. But I think they made a little error right here. They actually accidentally wired 
the original for the rest of the world turn signals that are built in the leg shield. So that's a plus. You can get rid of these pods and you just plug the connector right in on, you know, you got to remove the glove box and there's a simple connection and you can have the built-in flush turn signals that look much better than these pods. No big deal at all, but as you can see, this one's rocking both of them for both the left and the right. Um, for the headlight, you can see it's got this pretty awesome looking running light. You got to start the motor up and just like any automatic scooter, you got to pull one or the other or both brakes and it comes right to life. Being a fuel injected motor, pretty, pretty easy to start. And you got a LED headlight also with a, a passing function as well. The horns, just a basic little horn. Um, you got the engine kill switch which is a little hard to uh, decipher because it is all black on a, a black switch body on the scooter. So you can accidentally wonder why it's not starting. And it could be either uh, that kill switch or if your uh, center stand is down or side stand is down. They did fix one issue that I found with the 150. You have the side stand down and you can crank the scooter and wonder why it's not starting. Uh, they now have the interlock uh, tied in with the electric start as well. So if the side stands down, you're not going to be able to crank the scooter. So it's a good improvement over that 150 because I have had calls in my service department. People say it can't start the scooter. Uh, as for the instrumentation, um, it's got a tachometer. It's got your miles per hour. You can change it to kilometers. It's got both an od odometer and a single trip odometer, a basic you know, five bar fuel gauge and on the right you got your coolant uh, temperature gauge. And some other basic indications, you know, from the ABS light, a low oil pressure, high beam, uh, turn signals and such on this little lower panel right here. And if you're wondering how to reset the trip odometer, it's kind of a little bit clumsy. You got to open the glove box, turn the key back on, and then find the little button up here that reset it. But I don't think too many people use the trip odometer. It's probably useful if you're going on a long trip, you want to log your mileage, or especially if you're trying to f figure out how far you go between uh, fuel stops. But that's up in there. Along with that switch, there is a auxiliary jack right here for charging a USB phone. And essentially the idea is you put a short cord and you could charge your phone while it's in the glove box. It's possible to have a RAM mount off the, the mirror stem and snake a cord right through the glove box door as well. So they have a single key that does both ignition and also will lock the steering. And if you want to open the glove box, it's no different than a vintage scooter. You got to move the key out of the uh, ignition and onto the glove box and turn it and open it up. Unlike the Vespas that have you know, much more sophisticated uh, locking system, electronically locked seat, along with a, um, you just push the key to open the glove box. So a little, little more elegant on the Vespas versus the more simple style key setup. They do have a Sidewinder key on these. Uh, we do have those available and I do have the machinery to cut these kind of keys if you ever do want a duplicate key. As for the fuel cap, it's accessed right under here, also with the key. And that just reveals the cap right here. And like I said, about two and a half gallons of usable capacity. I think the, the total capacity of the tank, they say, is 10.5 liters. Um, but I don't think it holds quite that much because you have the volume of the fuel pump also in the tank. So it's got an in-tank fuel pump, uh, like pretty much all other fuel-injected um, scooters. For the front suspension, you see it's got the classic Lambretta style front end with the trailing link suspension. It has adjustable preload shocks. You got a double piston caliper with a wave rotor. Uh, it's not the strongest braking system that I've ever experienced. It's probably possible. I'll look into uh, sourcing centered uh, brake pads for the front. That should improve. And you can see it's got that slotted wheel, which they refer to as a tone wheel. And that's part of the anti-lock braking system. Uh, I'll tell you the very best upgrade that they made to the front end is putting Pirelli Angel tires. Um, the prior generations always came with um, 
rubbish tires as far as I'm concerned, and I've changed them out on 150s um, for customers that wore out those original rubbish tires and put uh, nice Pirellis or I did some Pilot Pierce, which I actually discontinued here in the United States, and the scooter handled so much better. Uh, it is possible, probably go plus one on this and bring the tire size right up to what the, the Vespa GTS is. It's also possible to put Dushinko white walls. We have the sizes that would match a scooter in um, white wall tires. So if you're looking for that classic look, you can put the white wall tires. They have the nice looking black inner spoke rims with the spun aluminum edge. That's pretty sharp. And of course, you see a little bit more of it on the right side. You don't quite get the same visuals as a Vespa wheel where it's single side swing arm where you see the complete wheel. Keep in mind when it comes time to change in the tire, uh, this scooter is quite difficult to change the tires, especially that uh, both the rear and the front, you got to dismantle the, the cowls. So you got the rear view of the scooter, you got nice LED tail and brake light assembly, and you have the LED turn signals that are in the body of the scooter. Um, I think those lights look pretty sharp. The thing that doesn't look so sharp on the scooter is the width of the, the rear end of the scooter. I'll just get right to the point. Um, you can see the prior video where I compared this, the, the dimensions of the scooter to the original Lambretta. And maybe that's just my personal preference, but one of the most appealing things of the Lambretta scooter is how skinny they are and slender versus the Vespas of that era. So two things I do like about this scooter is the badges. They stepped up the quality of the badges quite a bit over the 150. Uh, they got these like diamond etched aluminum badges. They have a really cool machine finish to them. Um, the camera probably doesn't do justice for them, but they, they reflect really nicely because there's like a diamond kind of cut to the aluminum finish on it. And then of course they added a couple little red accents to it as well. I also have a single ABS badge that's on the fender. It's kind of funny. Then they added the flashing. That's always been a very popular option on the 150. So both the left and the right side have that vintage style flashing. And if you don't like it, it's just adhered with double stick tape. It is possible to remove it if, it's, if you're going for that clean look. Um, both the left and the right side also have royal alloy badges as well, all aluminum. Uh, looking at the muffler, it's kind of a quite a different design compared to the Vespa mufflers. Very skinny and thin. Uh, it's, it's fairly quiet, maybe not quite as quiet as the new Vespa GTS 300 HPE, but similar to the 2019 or prior GTS. Um, one thing that is good about it is it does have a much longer header versus the Vespas that are sold here in North America. So you know that graphite bushing is gonna last a long time. And that's always been a pitfall of the Vespas, having a very short header that deteriorates that graphite bushing. And I'm sure at some point somebody's gonna make a performance muffler, but the hottest performance upgrade you could ever do for this scooter would be a Molosi big valve cylinder head. So of course everybody wants to see what's under the hood. Well, on the Royal Alloys, it takes a little bit more. You actually need almost a handful of tools to get these side covers off. And I'll tell you what you can do with these cows on. You could barely get your fingers up in here to check the oil. It does have a traditional dipstick. It's a little bit of a knuckle dragger right here to get this dipstick off. But hey, at least you can do it pretty easily. The new Vespa GTS 300 HPE has got a rather difficult dipstick to check. Um, but let's get right to it. I'll get both the cows off. I already got the right side off. So you pretty much need an eight millimeter, 10 millimeter, a little combination wrench and a Phillips screwdriver. Uh, would have been nice if they made it like the, the genuine McCoy that had a nice lever. But of course on these modern scooters, oftentimes you don't need to take this, this side cover off, you know, except for, for standard routine uh, services. You know, there's no reason really to dismantle this on the side of the road, like a classic scooter where you may need to tinker with it. So on this little screw on the side, you need to have a eight millimeter combination wrench and a Phillips screwdriver. And takes a little bit of feeling around to get to that 
nut on the back side. So you get that screw out of the way. I'll tell you one thing, all these panels are kind of under tension. So, you know, sometimes you gotta shift things around. So you get that screw out of the way. You move up underneath here and there's gonna be a, a single 10 millimeter nut that you need to loosen up. So once you get that started, definitely not doing that with just uh, no tools at all to get these sides off. Uh, they do include a basic toolkit with the scooter. But definitely one of the pitfalls of the Royal Alloys. You know, anytime in service I hear my technicians grumble about taking these side covers off. And oftentimes if you're doing a major service, both sides come off. So here I got a eight millimeter combination wrench and my eight millimeter socket. And we'll get both the, the nut and the bolt out of the way along with a pair of washers. And again, you kind of got to shift everything around to get everything disassembled. This is going through sheet metal. So at this point, you can lift the seat and you can carefully lift these uh, side cowls right out of the way. So sometimes the front will be kind of hanging up on that threaded stud that comes through. And, and you'll see there's going to be a wire that still tethers the cowl. So sometimes you need to hold the cowl and reach up to the connector and there's like get your nail into the release of the connector and then you'll be able to separate this cowl here and release the connector. And now you re remove the cowl. You can see they have a nice heat insulation on both the left and the right side cowl. You got that single screw that's threaded into the sheet metal. All right, so underneath the covers here, of course you got a steel fuel tank. Uh, it's got an integral uh, electronic fuel pump and fuel filter in there. You're wondering what this big aluminum tower is. Well, that's the coolant radiator cap. The reason they put it so high is so you're above the thermostat level. So the thermostat's on the very top of the cylinder head. And I'll show you the radiator later, but it's, it's um, kind of buried under there. Of course, you never take this off when it's warm. But it's a traditional cap, unlike the Vespas that have a pressurized reservoir. It's a little bit different setup. They got a coolant reservoir um, right here underneath the, the, the frame as well. Uh, looks like they use a blue coolant, which is probably a pentafrost, real similar to what the BMWs use. Um, you're wondering what this manifold here with lots of uh, braided flexible lines going into it. Uh, that's your ABS pump modulator. It actually looks identical to the one that's found in the modern day uh, Vespas. And I assume it is the same one, either made by Continental or there's a couple other manufacturers of that pump. Uh, this is your evaporative emissions system right here. And it's got a purge valve, this is an electronically controlled purge valve. So that's similar to what's found on the Euro 5 uh, Vespas. Um, it's always worth keeping this. A lot of people want to take this off. It doesn't get in the way. It never really has any problems unless you just severely overfill the tank all the time. Um, and it keeps your garage from smelling like a gas factory. So one thing to keep in mind if you're gonna keep that in place. Um, this is your air box. Looks very similar to the Vespa GTS. Probably uses the identical filter in there. You can see the belt cover is identical to the 2019 and prior model GTSs. And you're wondering about changing your drive belt. Well, we've got the cows off. You can see it's quite a bit more of a task. Um, you either need to disconnect the shocks uh, and several other cables and really, really drop the motor, or more likely you'd remove the floorboard, you know, and some of the subframe that holds the floorboard. So there's quite a few fasteners. Um, doing a belt job isn't all that difficult to do on a Vespa, but on this, you're definitely gonna be going through several more steps to probably make the whole process at least uh, twice as long as on the comparable Vespa because of how they have this motor packaged into this scooter frame. 
Uh, it's got the fully fuel injected motor. It's got the latest uh, uh, MIU fuel injection system. Looks similar to what's found on the newest GTS um, scooters. So moving on to the right side, you have an ignition coil, which looks like the standard fare off the earlier GTSs. You got a very unique muffler design and a swing arm support that's real similar to the Vespas. Um, you can see the shocks are way more laid back. They're kind of further back in the mounting point versus the standard Vespa one. Got a much larger voltage regulator because you just have a lot more electronic systems on here. Uh, the battery is accessed through this little door right here. It's rather difficult to get that battery out, but uh, not really much reason to, to access that battery too often. Um, you got the starter relay, oil filter down there, oxygen sensor. Um, of course, all the same parts as you find on the Vespa, so they're very readily available if you need spare parts like air filter, oil filter, and the dry belt. They're all gonna be identical parts to what's used on the Vespa GTS 300. So one thing that this scooter has that a Vespa does not is it's got this diagnostic connector. And you may ask, maybe you're not familiar with automotive diagnostic on modern day vehicles, pretty much everything 2000 and newer, or actually 96 and newer is you get these basic scan tools, which is oh, the OBD2 interface. And guess what? This scooter uses a standard interface, unlike nearly all motorcycles and other scooters that need to have a specialized tester. So, you know, you turn this on, maybe you have the check engine light and you're wondering what's going on. You can just use a standard scanner scan tool. Obviously, if you have a much more sophisticated, this is a real basic one. I have a, a, a sophisticated tester that can data log every sensor on the motor. Um, it's not quite as advanced as a modern automobile, but if you do have a problem with the scooter, at least uh, you got a standardized interface for diagnosing electronic issues. And the last thing is if you have electrical fault, there's your fuse block right underneath that right hand side cover with all the fuses. Um, I think you need the service manual to kind of ID what all these fuses do, uh, various different circuits. Um, but that's where they are. Um, definitely a little wor more work to work on when it comes time to services. Obviously a basic oil change you could do with just taking off the, the left hand side cowl. But typically any of the major services, uh, you're going to be in here for a while. Um, getting to work on. Same with the, uh, the rear wheel, quite a bit to dismantle to get to the rear wheel. So you have all the advantages of a liquid cool motor. They typically last longer. They can run at higher speed uh, for much longer. They also put out a higher specific uh, horsepower output for the typical engine displacement. There's a lot more advantages than disadvantages for a modern liquid cooled motor. And of course, uh, they need to do that also to beat the current emission standards for this size class motor. And the nice thing is you do not see a radiator anywhere except for when you look underneath. So it's got a flat radiator with a scoop and a cooling fan that's located under here. I'm not sure how efficient this is. I can tell you the Vespa GTSs have a very efficient cooling system even though they have quite a bit of plumbing. This ironically has less plumbing because the radiator is so close to the engine and there's only one radiator. Uh, pitfall of this, of course, anybody notices is, is a, quite a bit lower. You know, you already are dealing with a higher floorboard than what most scooters of this class are, but the radiator does hang a little bit lower. I think if you're cautious with it, you'll always be fine, but if you're gonna be going on rough off-road or drop down a very steep curve, that's where you may run into a problem um, with this radiator setup. Um, obviously, I think the first thing that might get taken out is the fan. This plastic is pretty rigid. You know, hopefully it keeps uh, debris from damaging any of those cooling system components. All right, well, thanks for watching and making it all the way through my video. Kind of just robots thoughts on the scooter and hopefully covered everything you ever thought and wondered about the scooter. Uh, look out for my next videos. Of course, the next video is I'm gonna accessorize this scooter with quite a few accessories that are already available uh, for the Royal Alloy uh, GP150 and the new GP300S. 
If you're looking to buy one of these, feel free to call the sales department. Uh, you can put a deposit on. They're pretty limited availability as of uh, early June 2022 here in North America. But we can certainly take a deposit and put you on a waiting list. Um, we had quite a few calls for the first batch that we have had available to our shop, Vespa Motorsport, here in San Diego. And thanks for watching. This is Robot here from Vespa Motorsport and ScooterWest.com. And if you're really curious about this uh, scooter in more depth, of course, check out my prior video about the 150. I talk about much of the same things. Um, the body style is pretty much unchanged um, between this 150 and higher performance 300. Until next time, Robot here from Vespa Motorsport.